It is late April 1863. The American Civil War has now entered its third year, and a stalemate has emerged in the Eastern Theater. Over the previous winter, Robert E. Lee, commander of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, had beaten back yet another Union bid to take Richmond at Fredericksburg. But now the Union has a new commander, General Hooker, popularly known by the sobriquet Fighting Joe. Under his leadership, the Army of the Potomac has stolen a march on the Confederates, crossed two rivers, and are beating down on Lee's left flank, preparing a killer blow. Outnumbered, and with the enemy closing in on two sides, Lee is trapped, and defeat or flight appear the only options. What happened next, however, was a series of ever more audacious maneuvers that would set the stage for the most dynamic battle of the American Civil War, and one that will ensure Lee's reputation as one of the great commanders of history. For those of you who've been following my channel for a while, you must have heard me say that making videos can be very time-consuming. So I want to welcome back a returning sponsor, a service that I actually use to make better videos. Thank you Storyblocks for supporting this video. Check this out. Typing Ukraine in the search gives me all of these awesome clips that I can use if I wanted to make a video about the conflict in Ukraine. Look, there are 99 pages of videos about this. You can pretty much search for anything and get similar results. With Storyblocks, you pay one set price and you get unlimited access to all this stuff. There's over a million assets on their website and you can download as much as you want. Also, if you're not an animator but you would like to do animation, Storyblocks has pre-made templates you can use to make great-looking animated videos. Best yet, Storyblocks now has a plugin for Adobe's After Effects and Premiere Pro, so now it's easy to browse assets directly. Long before Storyblocks sponsored my channel, I've been using their service for years, even before I became a YouTuber back in my freelancing days. That's because this is the best place to find a bunch of good stuff for very cheap. You pay one set price, either annual or monthly, that's it. There's no hidden fees. Anything you download with Storyblocks is 100% royalty-free. I can vouch for the quality of their service and it's a very small price to pay to enhance your creativity with access to millions of assets on their website. So thank you again Storyblocks for supporting my channel. There's a link in my description, storyblocks.com slash historymarsh. Clicking that link, unsurprisingly, helps support my channel, but it also allows you to go and check out this amazing service. Although Union forces made great gains in the spring and summer 1862, securing key points along the vital Mississippi River, occupying most of the border state of Tennessee, and coming within a few days' march of the rebel capital at Richmond, they were unable to capitalize on them. Instead, the Confederacy demonstrated its own vigor by launching two separate offensives in the autumn, one into Maryland and the other into Kentucky. Both of these invasions were eventually pushed back. However, they revealed that the South was ready to take advantage of Northern supineness to press and threaten where best they could. In September 1862, emboldened by the Confederate withdrawal, US President Abraham Lincoln released a draft of an Emancipation Proclamation to go into effect the coming January. This document will liberate all slaves in the states still in rebellion and make complete abolition the North's chief policy objective. Lincoln hoped that this gambit would place Southerners on the defensive philosophically for the remainder of the conflict. But Lincoln also knew that bold speech needed to be supported by bold action. Five days after the midterm elections, which saw Democrats pick up seats in Congress, and frustrated by the Army of the Potomac's inactivity, Lincoln replaced its popular commander, George McClellan, with Ambrose Burnside. 
He hoped Burnside would bring on an engagement before year's end to take advantage of Northern superiority in numbers. A decisive defeat of Lee would yield important political dividends. Within days of taking command, Burnside aggressively moved south. He reached the Rappahannock River in late November. Unfortunately, logistical difficulties, namely acquiring enough pontoon boats to make sufficiently quick crossings, resulted in a delay of several weeks. This gave Lee plenty of time to maneuver his army into a strong defensive position along Maury's Heights, south and west of the city of Fredericksburg. By December 11th, Burnside had his boats and resumed the offensive, crossing the Rappahannock under fire, followed the next day by a series of direct assaults on Lee's position. The results were catastrophic. In the most lopsided engagement of the entire Civil War, the North left over 12,000 killed and wounded on the battlefield. Despite the disaster at Fredericksburg, Burnside thought he could still salvage the situation. The following month, he sought to move north around Lee's left flank, hoping to take advantage of the frozen ground to move more quickly and the correspondingly lower river levels to cross the Rappahannock at United States Ford instead of needing to rely on pontoon boats. Burnside's maneuver would be covered both by a feint to the south and by the largest cavalry raid ever envisioned to the west, intended to circle Lee's army as well as Richmond before rejoining Union forces on the James Peninsula. Unusually warm weather on January 20th, the first day of operations, got the operation off to a promising start. But the weather stayed warm and rain came down instead of snow. The roads turned into sloughs, the riverbanks into marshes. General Lee, discerning the maneuver, sent detachments to oppose the crossing. With the casualties of Fredericksburg fresh in his mind, and with the river now rising amidst the continual rain, Burnside had to pull back. Two days later, he tendered his resignation to Lincoln, who replaced him with Joe Hooker. Although recognized for solid performance in the Army's past three campaigns, Hooker's personality, ambitious and abrasive, did not endear him to his fellow officers. In fact, his own self-serving attitude may have led the generals to suspect the same spirit in his more enterprising subordinates such as Reynolds, Meade, and Sedgwick. The atmosphere Hooker created at headquarters was one of personal dependence which, when combined with a commander's natural desire for secrecy, would have paralyzing consequences on the upcoming campaign. Confident where Burnside was self-critical, Hooker spent the rest of the winter bringing a similar spirit to an army that had been slogging through mud. He abolished the Grand Divisions and improved camp conditions. With morale restored by the middle of February, Hooker turned to operations. Willing to take every possible advantage of his numerical superiority, Hooker sent 9th Corps under General Baldy Smith to make threatening maneuvers on the James Peninsula, the scene of last spring's offensive. Urged by Confederate President Jefferson Davis and confident in being able to recall them quickly, Lee countered by dispatching 1st Corps Commander James Longstreet, his aggressive divisional commanders John Bell Hood and George Pickett, and 13,000 men to guard the capital. Smaller forces were detached to protect the North Carolinian coast. Although the natural defense of Fredericksburg have proven their worth, Lee was left with about 60,000 men to confront Hooker's army of 130,000. There will be little margin for error. Informed that Lee had reduced his force, Hooker next sought to freeze his foe in place by moving aggressively along three separate fronts confident that the outnumbered Confederates could not stop all three at once, and gambling that Lee would not aggressively move against any of them 
until it was too late. First, Hooker dispatched Darius Couch, his only trusted subordinate, downstream with his Second Corps to turn the Confederate right. General Sedgwick with three corps would push forward over the old pontoon bridges at Fredericksburg and threaten Murray's Heights. Hooker himself would command the remaining three infantry corps and all of the army's cavalry on a flanking maneuver to the west that practically replicated Burnside's doomed mud march. Lee would either be forced to evacuate his strong position or to give battle on three sides that would surely end in a decisive defeat. By mid-April, the Army of the Potomac was ready to move. On the 13th, General Stoneman and 10,000 cavalry headed north and west along the banks of the Rappahannock. Anticipating hard riding in the near future and not wanting to tire his mounts, Stoneman adopted a slow pace. It proved an unfortunate decision. That night marked the beginning of an intense spring rainfall that continued over the next few days. Within a few hours, the Rappahannock had risen and fording at any point became impractical for a fortnight. Undaunted by the delay, on April 27th, a confident hooker began his march, taking 70,000 men, 5th Corps under Meade, 11th Corps under Howard, and 12th Corps under Slocum and reaching Kelly's Ford late the following evening. Union skirmishers quickly drove off the outnumbered Confederate pickets and crossed the river all through the night and into the next day. By late afternoon on the 29th, lead detachments from 11th and 12th Corps had passed the Rapidan, repelling patrols of Jeb Stewart's cavalry along the Orange Turnpike. 5th Corps now moved aggressively to the east driving away skirmishers under Confederate Generals Mahone and Posey and uncovering Eli's, Todd's, and United States Ford's. Meanwhile, Generals Couch and Sedgwick did their part to support Hooker's flanking maneuver. The former moved his Second Corps and probed a crossing of the Rappahannock below Fredericksburg, while the latter advanced half of his First, Third, and Sixth Corps across the old pontoon bridges into the town itself. Confronted with this direct show of force and with conflicting reports about the rest of the Union Army, Lee held his position. It appeared that Hooker's assessment of his opponent was correct. His aggressive strategy was working. Late on the night of the 29th, however, Lee received insurmountable evidence that Hooker was threatening his left with a force larger than that of his entire army. Eager to maintain his position as long as possible, the Confederate general decided to match Hooker's boldness with an even riskier gamble. Lee knew he could not contend with numbers. His only hope was to take advantage of the terrain in the wilderness, a dense mass of secondary growth forest transected by a few narrow dirt roads, the Orange Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road. Maneuvering in this area would be incredibly difficult. Unit cohesion could quickly be lost, along with one sense of direction. Lee dispatched the remaining brigades of Richard Anderson's divisions westward to meet Mahone and Posey and form a makeshift defensive line across the Orange Plank Road at Zone Church. He ordered Thomas Stonewall Jackson and his Second Corps to slide into position opposite Fredericksburg. Lastly, he sent a telegram to Longstreet to return post-haste. Both sides spent the soggy April 30th maneuvering, the Confederates desperately, the Union deliberately. Encouraged by his success, the ever-confident Hooker ordered a consolidation at Chancellorsville, a two-story brick house at the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and the Orange Turnpike. Hooker also ordered Sedgwick to send Couch's Second Corps and General Dan Sickles' Third Corps across the newly opened fords to reinforce the Union right while continuing his crossing with the rest of First and Sixth Corps. I have Lee in one hand and Richmond in the other, 
Hooker remarked encouragingly. By 11 a.m., advance units of 5th Corps had occupied the Chancellor House, and General Meade eagerly sent skirmishers down the Orange Turnpike. But Hooker countermanded this decision, opting to wait for Couch and Sickles before moving again. Although he had received intelligence about enemy troops along the turnpike, Hooker knew Lee could not possibly have the numbers to challenge him. He could afford to wait and gather strength. General Lee spent most of the day gauging how few men he can leave to bluff Sedgwick into staying passive. General Lafayette McClaw's division had already been sent to reinforce General Anderson, and Jackson's Second Corps had been primed to move before the next dawn. Only Barksdale's brigade from Longstreet's First Corps and Early's division from Jackson's Second Corps would hold the front on Murray's Heights. Lee was aware that only a quick strike would disorient Hooker and recapture operational initiative, yet equally aware that he had nowhere near the numbers needed for such a strike. Greater risks still needed to be taken. As dawn broke over a drier May 1st morning, both army commanders ordered their men forward. Hooker dispatched a portion of Meade's 5th Corps north along the river road to open up Banks Ford, while another detachment under General Sykes was to push along the turnpike towards Fredericksburg. Meade would be supported by Slocum's 12th Corps pushing south and east along the Plank Road. Howard's 11th Corps, composed of less reliable men, were to secure the crossroads out towards the Wilderness Church and await General Couch's 2nd Corps and Sickles' Third Corps. On the Confederate side, the energetic Stonewall Jackson began moving even earlier. By 8 a.m., three of his four divisions were well on their way, marching along both the Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road. By 11 a.m., he met up with McClaws and Anderson and ordered them to abandon their defensive works and to push westward. Jackson understood his army's dilemma as well as Lee and hoped to give his commander the luxuries of time and space to consider all viable options, even a withdrawal southwards. A confrontation was not long in coming. Within a half hour after setting out, Confederate skirmishers opened fire against Meade and Slocum's forces along the turnpike and the plank road. Although Meade's men continued unimpeded along the river road, Jackson's audacious confrontation in his center gave Hooker reason to pause. According to the commander's own account of the battle later, it was at this moment that Hooker lost faith in Hooker. At 1 p.m., with elements of the Union Army within distance of Banks Ford, Hooker gave the order to fall back to their morning positions. Baffled and enraged, Meade and Slocum felt they had no choice but to accept. Around midnight, Lee and Jackson held a conference in the woods. Although satisfied they had slowed Hooker, neither were sure about how best to proceed. Shortly afterwards, Lee's cavalry commander, Jeb Stewart, rode up with two valuable pieces of information. First, an overconfident Howard had permitted 11th Corps to set up without properly protecting their flank west of Wilderness Church along the Plank Road. Second, a local resident indicated the presence of a little-used path that could take the Confederates across the Union front to attack the vulnerable flank, using the dense foliage of the wilderness as a cover. Aware of their difficult position and intrigued by the opportunity, Jackson immediately proposed to Lee the most audacious maneuver in the entire war. He urged Lee to split his already outnumbered force in half. Jackson, with 28,000 men, would leave that night to fall upon the unsuspecting Union right in the course of the day. Lee, with the remaining 15,000, scarcely a division in size, would engage in aggressive feints to occupy the attention of Hooker's 70,000 men. Either astounded by his subordinates' daring or recognizing a better option did not exist, 
a remarkably composed Lee, agreed. At 4 a.m. on May 2nd, advanced troops under Robert Rhodes moved out, followed by the divisions of Colston and A.P. Hill. An early rainfall deadened the sound of marching feet, and, as morning dawned, generated a low-lying fog that further obscured the Confederates' movements. By 7.30 a.m., Jackson's men turned onto the wilderness byways, with the weather getting warmer and drier. Shortly after Jackson's foot cavalry made their turnoff, Hooker, increasingly nervous from the day before, inspected his lines. Dissatisfied by Howard's position, he ordered Reynolds' first corps up from Fredericksburg to cross and further bolster his right flank. Unfortunately, as a result of his countermand the day before, Banks' ford had not been secured, resulting in a longer trek to cross at U.S. Ford. The day would become a race to see which side can get to the Wilderness Church first. At 9 a.m., as Hooker completed his inspection, the first of Lee's feigned assaults began against the Union left. Around the same time, advance units from 3rd Corps, forming a salient near Hazel Grove, observed Confederate soldiers near Catherine's Furnace. The aggressive Sickles pushed his men forward while sending a messenger back to headquarters. Hooker gave him a free hand to harass the enemy. As fighting continued into the afternoon, Lee funneled Posey's brigade south to press Sickles on his flank and slow down his assault. Meanwhile, Hooker moved Slocum into the area and depleted his available reserves to reinforce 3rd Corps. This concentration of men created a significant salient in the Union line, and the limited road network would make it increasingly difficult for effective relief to be sent to either flank, but Hooker remained unconcerned. He was confident that the near arrival of Reynolds' corps will make up the difference. At 2.30 p.m., a large push from Sickles captured most of the 23rd Georgia, Jackson's rearguard. Assessing the action and the southwesterly direction of the Confederate movement, Hooker tried to convince himself that Lee is in retreat. The Union commander sent a fast rider to Fredericksburg, urging Sedgwick to assault the heights, which he is confident must be practically undefended, before nightfall. Hooker also sought confirmation for his belief from Howard, urging the corps commander to send pickets forward into the undergrowth. Scouts from 11th Corps had already alerted their superiors to the presence of Confederates in the vicinity, but a dubious Howard dismissed this as the offspring of fears. He had his men construct shallow rifle pits, but did little more. Even as Sickles was gathering up Jackson's rear guard, the first soldiers of Rhodes' division reached their destination on the Union flank. Over the next two and a half hours, the Confederates moved into position north of the Orange Turnpike. Rhodes and Colston were to lead the way, with the aggressive A.P. Hill in reserve to exploit their gains. It was now 5 p.m., the sun was setting, and the soldiers of 11th Corps were preparing their suppers. As the sun was setting, Jackson told Rhodes to go forward. The assault was devastating. Men of the 41st and 45th New York simply turned and ran, while their compatriots in the 54th New York and the 153rd Pennsylvania fired two volleys before breaking and running. Some companies of the 75th Ohio attempted a countercharge in desperation, which briefly slowed the onslaught before they, too, were caught up in the maelstrom and swept down the turnpike. Completely startled by the course of events, General Howard seized the national standard in the stump of his right arm and bravely rode among his men, urging them to rally to the colors, but to no avail. The entire Union right broke, and the fleeing men crashed into the flank of Third Corps, which was forced to turn face and reform in the growing darkness. 
In less than 90 minutes, the Union line had been pushed back over a mile. However, growing darkness, the difficult terrain, and increasing northern resistance slowed down the Confederate advance, and by 8 p.m. the lines had stabilized. Well aware that the Confederate disadvantage in numbers and their split position could be seen in the daylight and easily be exploited by a more energetic commander, Stonewall Jackson moved among his lines like a man possessed, eager to bring up A.P. Hill's fresh reserves. He seemed poised for a night attack along the new Union right to cut them off from U.S. Ford and surround them in the wilderness. In the evening fog and mist, Jackson and his staff rode out on reconnaissance, but soon realized the enemy are much closer than expected. As they returned to their lines around 9.30 p.m., pickets from the 18th North Carolina mistook them for Union cavalry and fired first a few shots and then two volleys into the group of horsemen. Jackson was hit near both wrists and more seriously injured by a bullet that entered his left arm above the elbow, shattering the bone and rupturing an artery. As he was transported to the rear for amputation, Jackson entrusted his corps command to A.P. Hill. Misfortune continued to plague the Confederacy. Less than an hour after taking command, Hill was hit by a piece of shrapnel in the leg that prevented him from walking or riding across the front. Like Jackson, Hill was aware of the vital importance of having a bold and aggressive commander in charge of the vulnerable southern position on the morrow. In an unusual decision, he passed command to Jeb Stuart, who, although a dashing cavalry commander and full of bravado, had never commanded infantry before. A tired Lee, awake for the past 24 hours, met with Stuart at 3.30 in the morning of May 3rd. Aware of Jackson's desire to cut off Hooker's line of retreat, Lee was far more concerned about the separated state of his outnumbered army and was unwilling to push his luck. He and Stuart agreed to consolidate their forces and push the Union out of Chancellorsville, through the wilderness, and back to Eli's and U.S. Ford's. The fighting that morning took place over Hazel Grove and Fairview Knoll, two elevated positions overlooking the collapsed Union right and center. The Confederates quickly seized first position by 6.30 a.m. and, under the guidance of Colonel E.P. Alexander, created a 30-gun battery to bombard the second eminence. Fairview Knoll, however, proved a tougher nut to crack, with multiple lines of defense fallback positions and breastworks to supplement the natural defensive position. Piecemeal assaults from 2nd Corps went nowhere, with some units suffering over 50% casualties. By 9.15 a.m., the Confederates had only taken two Union lines, and momentum was beginning to turn against them, when fate intervened once more. General Hooker had been watching the action from the porch at Chancellor House when an artillery shell struck the porch beam he had been leaning against right above his head. Hooker was thrown to the ground, unconscious. His staff, gathering around him, feared he is dead. In a few minutes, however, the commander regained consciousness and, in a show of bravado, paraded around on his white horse until his staff persuaded him to retire to a safer location. Shortly afterwards, Hooker complained of an intense headache. A modern medical diagnosis suggests he had suffered a concussion. He called for his friend and confidant, General Couch, who, realizing the state of his commander's condition, expected to be given temporary command of the Army of the Potomac. Surprisingly, Hooker refused to relinquish command, using Couch instead as a personal secretary and mouthpiece. This merely bogged down the reception of information and the execution of orders and exacerbated the sluggishness of any Union response. As Lee sent the divisions of Anderson and McClaws to increase the Confederate onslaught, an enfeebled hooker ordered Couch to evacuate the Chancellorsville position at 10 a.m. 
Two entire corps, first and fifth, have barely been committed. Making matters worse, as Union forces withdrew, the house and the woods around it caught fire. The agonizing screams of the wounded trapped in the inferno tormented the survivors during the retreat. Despite still being outnumbered, and with Second Corps clearly exhausted after the endeavors of the past 24 hours, Lee and Stuart sought to press their advantage. The Army's cavalry were dispatched to seal the northern forts over the Rapidan, channeling Hooker towards the single U.S. Ford and his pontoon bridges. It is possible that with his back to the river, a broken Hooker might surrender en masse. Just as the horsemen moved out, however, Lee received startling news from General Early. Sedgwick had broken through the lines at Fredericksburg and was moving down the turnpike towards his rear. All throughout May 1st and 2nd, Early had bluffed the Union forces successfully, but on the evening of the second day had received word through Lee updating him on Jackson's ambitious flank assault. A misinterpretation of the news caused Early to think that Lee desperately needed him. That evening, he set off with most of his division, leaving only a small brigade of Mississippians under General Barksdale to hold the heights. At 7 a.m. on May 3rd, Sedgwick, reinforced by Gibbon's division from 2nd Corps and urged once more by Hooker into action, attacked Marie's Heights. Wildly outnumbered, Barksdale's men stopped two separate assaults. Under the guise of a flag of truce to collect the wounded, however, an observant Union officer saw how few men actually held the line and urged his superiors to press the advance with all their disposable force. The third Union assault began at 10 a.m. Within 25 minutes, the heights had been taken and the Confederates were in full retreat south along Telegraph Road. Yet at this moment, Sedgwick critically dallied, wanting fresh troops to lead the advance along the turnpike and ostensibly waiting for a victorious hooker to show up in the Confederate rear. Five hours of valuable time were wasted, permitting Early to set up a defensive perimeter by Salem Church and allowed Barksdale's defeated troops to regroup. Even after Sedgwick moved out in mid-afternoon, an active defense by General Cadmus Wilcox, taking advantage of every small ridge that crosses the Orange Plank Road, slowed the Union advance to a crawl. That evening, Wilcox set up a more determined defensive position, erecting breastworks near the vicinity of Salem Church. An assault at 5.30 p.m. by Sedgwick was halted in its tracks by the timely arrival of Confederate reinforcements. That evening, Sedgwick detached a ford north to keep Banks's ford open in case a retreat was necessary, while Lee sent even more reinforcements under Lafayette McClaws to bolster Wilcox's position. Upon his arrival, McClaws set up south of the Union lines, while General Early moved further east, aiming to recapture Fredericksburg and surround Sedgwick, or else pin him against the Rappahannock, where he could be destroyed. For all the dramatic movement of the past three days, the last phase of the Battle of Chancellorsville was anticlimactic. Although General Early did his part in retaking Fredericksburg and driving Gibbon across the Rappahannock, General McClaws proved strangely lethargic, refusing to push decisively against Sedgwick. By the time Lee had arrived on the field with the remainder of Anderson's divisions, precious time had been lost maneuvering and counter-maneuvering. And now, the thoroughly exhausted Confederate army could only muster a half-hearted attack at 6 p.m. The assault soon petered out in the growing evening fog, and Sedgwick evacuated across Banks's ford that night. Rain fell that evening and into the morning of May 5th. By 9 a.m. on May 6th, all Union forces were across the Rappahannock once more. The most immediate consequence of the battles of Chancellorsville and Salem Church was felt within the Confederacy. 
Although Stonewall Jackson's amputation had been successful, pneumonia set in, and the general whom Lee referred to as his right arm died on May 10th. The blow was both psychological as well as practical, as Lee was forced to reorganize his army into three corps. Lamentably, neither of the new corps commanders, Richard Ewell and A.P. Hill, had the vision or initiative of Jackson, with the result that Lee was forced to resort to more defensive strategies and tactics. Undaunted by the loss, however, Lee would seize the strategic initiative after a few weeks' rest. In early June, he moved his army into the Shenandoah Valley and headed north. The still shattered Hooker limply shadowed this second invasion before he was relieved of command in mid-June and sent to the Western Theater. His replacement, the irascible George Meade, would decisively shatter the stalemate in the east outside the small town of Gettysburg. The following year, as subordinate to Ulysses S. Grant, Meade would lead the Army of the Potomac back into the wilderness. Rather than disperse their superior numbers in fancy maneuvering, Meade and Grant would use their army as a hammer, dealing blow after blow to the Army of Northern Virginia, and ultimately bringing it to its knees at Appomattox Courthouse. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.